Okay, uh, this is Paul Geyer, and I will be the presenter today for this uh, webinar, Ethical Issues from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse. Um, I'm going to type a little message in here in the chat box. Okay, I just sent a little message. Let me know if there uh, are any problems with the audio. Um, we uh, had a uh, little administrative uh, issue we had to deal with this morning. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to get my screen to do what I want it to do. Uh, stick with me. I'll get going here shortly. Ethical okay. issues from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, these webinars, the way they proceed um, is I press on with the discussion for 50 minutes and then we take a 10 minute break so folks can check their emails, that sort of thing. Uh, keep uh, uh, doing that same cycle. 50 minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes, 10 minutes. Now this is only a two hour or two PDH webinar. So we'll just go through that cycle twice. The, um, this is uh, an interactive webinar and questions and comments are welcome and encouraged. And um, we uh, have two ways of communicating. One is you can just speak right up on the audio stream. The other is to use a little chat box and type in your question or comment. Occasionally we ha might have audio difficulties, uh, echoes and feedback and that sort of thing. If that happens, I may need to mute one or more of your audio streams to get rid of that annoyance and um, then you would just have the chat box to communicate with, but the chat box works pretty well. Uh, you might want to um, also get a copy of these PowerPoints just for your own entertainment value. Uh, and you can do that by going to the uh, website and logging in and following the instructions. And I think you can get a set of them. Okay, uh, here we go. Ethical issues from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse. And okay, this is kind of what I will be talking about today, the chapters in the book, if you will. Uh, I'll be talking about the history of the project, how it uh, came to be. And this is important because the way that the uh, project uh, came about is, is really what raised the ethical issues and the, um, in my view, the ethical failures. Uh, now, the um, with these ethical issue webinars, there is, of course, room for differences of opinion and there may be uh, people who would see things differently than I do. But uh, as the saying goes, I've got the microphone, so you're gonna uh, be hearing my view of what the ethical failures were. So the, the history of the project, how it came about, um, and then the uh, design proposals, um, and we'll 
see what I'm talking about there as we move forward. Uh, the, the, uh, the issue or a, a manifestation of the issue of, of what was going wrong with this bridge was oscillations of the bridge up and down, up and down, up and down. And these were observed even before construction was completed and the, uh, uh, the workmen uh, working on the bridge uh, nicknamed it Galloping Gertie. More about that later. A uh, few comments on mitigation efforts. Uh, obviously, the bridge bouncing up and down. Uh, <clears throat> engineers knew that there was something wrong with that bridge, and there was some mitigation uh, remedial uh, measures that needed to be implemented. And uh, it was tried to get some of them implemented, but uh, they were not effectively implemented uh, before the bridge collapsed. And um, then um, the uh, <clears throat> investigation of the, the collapse, the post-mortem, the finger pointing, we'll look at that. Then uh, we'll try to, I will try to bring this all together uh, in, uh, and uh, give you my perception of what the ethical issues were and the ethical failures. Uh, lessons learned as a result of this bridge collapse, yes. Uh, the bridge design, the bridge engineering community did definitely learn from this uh, collapse. And then uh, aftermath and the replacement bridge. Uh, we'll just see a picture of that as we move on. Now, uh, here uh, are some background uh, points to or concepts to keep in mind, I feel. Uh, first of all is the uh, concept of uh, the kind of knowledge that we as engineers employ in whatever we're doing. Uh, there's the theoretical knowledge and uh, experiential knowledge. The theoretical is kind of the stuff you got in engineering school. F equals MA, Bernoulli's equation, uh, <clears throat> uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, but then there is experiential knowledge. Once you get out uh, in the real world and you're working on real projects and you've got something or other that uh, you need to design, uh, I mean, that's what you've been assigned here, design this. Um, you, you, well, the first question you ask is, well, how has this been done in the past? I've never, uh, never designed one of these things, whatever it is, a building, a bridge, a dam. Um, so how have they been uh, designed in the past? So experiential knowledge, theoretical knowledge, that's the, the book stuff, uh, experiential knowledge though, how has this been done in the past and has it worked? Um, and if the experiential knowledge uh, envelope, if you will, that, that body of experiential knowledge of how to design an earth fill dam, how to design a cantilever bridge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If that body of knowledge is inadequate, uh, what do you do? Uh, uh, the longest uh, uh, bridge span, say, that's ever been done 2,000 feet uh, for a suspension bridge. Uh, and um, you have to design a bridge that's uh, uh, 2,020 feet. Uh, how do you go about that? Or, but if it's, uh, you're stepping further outside the experiential envelope, i.e., wow, it's going to take a 3,000 foot span to uh, get across this body of water, um, then you're, you're being asked to take a much larger step outside of the experiential envelope. And then, uh, as I hope we will see as we move forward with this project or this uh, presentation, is I will be um, 
pointing the the directing your attention if you will to commercial interests and the influence that they have on design proposals and the way uh, designs uh, for projects come into being. And these are economic pressures in the business that we are in. Uh, we may not know it unless if we're working for a public agency or uh, a large uh, engineering firm and you're not really uh, having to worry about uh, uh, getting contracts and that sort of thing. Um, but the, um, uh, these are factors that uh, are important, I think. And, and I think this uh, project illustrates that. Here is a little bit about me and what I've been doing for the last few decades. Um, for 35 years, I was with a large public agency. Uh, well, pardon me, step back. For 18 years, 17 years, I was with a large public agency, the state of California. Uh, then in career number two, I had um, uh, for 18 years, uh, a, was managing a small architectural engineering firm. Um, working, uh, worked a lot for the federal government, for the military and military facilities. After that, 35 years then, uh, uh, for an additional nine years, I was in what you might call the public policy arena, where I was a principal advisor to the California legislature on infrastructure and capital outlay projects. I got registered in a few different things along the way. Uh, I'm basically a mechanical engineer, though that's my degree and my first registration. Now, don't hold that against me. I am not a bridge designer, never have been a bridge engineer. But um, uh, that, uh, in my view, in no way uh, inhibits an appreciation of what happened with this project, because this wasn't a, um, uh, a, a technical nitty gritty type of an issue. It was a procedural uh, issue, uh, procedural in the sense of uh, the way the uh, design and construction uh, work was procured and implemented. More about that later. So anyway, that that's uh, what I've been doing for the last few uh, now, uh, what we're talking about is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And uh, the bridge we are talking about is the original Tacoma uh, Narrows Bridge. And uh, after this uh, bridge collapsed, then a replacement bridge was put in place. And it's uh, there doing a, a good job, uh, very serviceable. And uh, the Tacoma Narrows is up in Washington State, up in the upper left-hand corner of the United States. And uh, it was uh, what it was, uh, it was a crossing of what is called Tacoma Narrows, which is part of Puget Sound, which uh, you may or may not know is kind of the the bay uh, up there by Seattle and Tacoma. Um, the uh, construction of the original bridge was completed in July of 1940. And in November of the same year, it collapsed. Now, um, I'll mention something uh, now, we can take care of this. Um, because we got kind of a late start this morning, I didn't have time to load the videos, but I have some videos uh, of the actual collapse. These were uh, eight millimeter movie films uh, taken by several people uh, of the collapse. And it's, uh, and the, the, 
this was something that could be uh, realized because everybody knew the uh, the bridge was uh, had serious problems and uh, there were these tremendous oscillations uh, that uh, were present and the uh, the bridge was closed uh, and uh, then after additional violent oscillations the bridge collapsed so there was time for people to get out there with movie cameras and take pictures so that's uh, uh, they're quite dramatic and I'll uh, I'll try to load those videos um, when uh, we take our first 10 minute break. Anyway, this is a picture of what we're talking about here. Uh, the, there you see Seattle and you see the uh, blue water there, that's Puget Sound. It, it is a bay that uh, connects to the ocean, to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it looks kind of like a, a uh, dish of spaghetti with all those bodies of water running around. And um, towards the uh, s lower center, you see the, uh, the city of Tacoma and the body of water passing by there. And that body of water is the Tacoma Narrows. And that is where the, um, uh, the bridge was constructed. Now, you also see on this map, uh, on this aerial, uh, the, uh, you see the city of Olympia, which is the state capital. And, uh, but you see three other things uh, called out here, McCord Airfield, Fort Lewis, and Bremerton Navy Yard. Um, the McCord Airfield uh, is, uh, was, uh, and it continues to be, a major Air Force uh, base. Uh, in, in it's called an airfield back uh, at this time because at this time, the late 30s and 40s, uh, there was no Air Force. The airplanes, the Army had all the airplanes, and so uh, this airfield it became McCord uh, Air Force Base. Uh, now, you also see just below that another military facility, Fort Lewis, uh, a very large, very important army base uh, there in the vicinity. And then uh, up to the top, you see the Bremerton Navy Shipyard, which is an extremely important uh, military facility, probably the, uh, the major uh, Navy facility uh, on the Pacific coast, uh, second only to San Diego. Uh, I think that's probably fair to say. So, and, and the reason I'm pointing these military facilities out will become clearer as I um, uh, press on. Um, okay, uh, so Seattle, Puget Sound, uh, the Tacoma Narrows, part of the uh, Puget Sound network of waterways, and then the three uh, military facilities, uh, Bremerton, McCord, and Fort Lewis. And my emphasis on these military facilities will uh, become clearer again as I move along. Um, <clears throat> Remember now what we're talking about uh, is back uh, in the 30s and moving up towards the 1940s and um, World War II. And uh, you could say probably legitimately that a major uh, function of McCord uh, Airfield and Fort Lewis, Washington was to protect the Bremerton Navy shipyard. And so uh, from a military perspective, being able to uh, move expeditiously, very expeditiously under, you know, wartime conditions from uh, Fort Lewis and um, <clears throat> McCord to Bremerton uh, was very important 
because uh, back in the late 30s and the 40s, uh, World War II was uh, looming on the horizon. Part of the, the threat the United States faced uh, was from attack by Japan uh, across the Pacific. And uh, probably the, uh, the primary uh, facility that uh, would be the target of the um, uh, Japanese forces uh, after, say, um, Pearl Harbor and Hawaii would be Bremerton. Um, and uh, so the, uh, being from the military perspective, being able to move expeditiously from McCord and uh, uh, Fort Lewis to Bremerton was very important. Here, uh, this, uh, uh, back at that time, there was no bridge across the Tacoma Narrows. And so this table here just gives an illustration of the driving times from different points around the, uh, uh, the Puget Sound and the Olympic Peninsula. Um, the Olympic Peninsula, the um, Puget Sound is kind of running around there in the Olympic Peninsula, which is a very rugged, uh, heavily forested, uh, uh, large, uh, pristine area although there was, there was logging going on there even at that time. But anyway, these are just some of the uh, 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 driving times uh, from point to point. Uh, but if you put in a Tacoma Narrows bridge, uh, things changed. So uh, like Tacoma to Gig Harbor, I, Gig Harbor is someplace there in the uh, Olympic Peninsula driving to it by the roads that existed at that time. It would be 107 miles. If there was a uh, Tacoma Narrows bridge, it would only be eight miles. The, uh, the driving time would be reduced from around two hours and 10 minutes to 17 minutes. Uh, and again, you have to understand or appreciate that this is being talked about from the military perspective. And if you think of how important uh, this time can be, just think about the uh, things you've uh, read about and seen in movies and on TV, this sort of thing, about the attack on Pearl Harbor. It um, was, you know, time was of the essence and at Pearl Harbor, um, it was inadequate. So uh, some other point to points, Bremerton, to McCord, uh, 79 miles driving around the existing roads. If a bridge existed at the Tacoma Narrows, it would be 39 miles. Uh, Tacoma to Port Archer, Port, Port Orchard, which is somewhere on that Olympic Peninsula, uh, driving time would be reduced from two hours to around 30 minutes. Tacoma to Bremerton, two hours to 40 minutes. Tacoma to Port Angeles, which is way up at the top of the uh, Olympic Peninsula, three and a half hours to two and a half hours. So uh, putting a bridge across the Tacoma Narrows uh, was something that as the specter of uh, World War who was moving forward was very important to the uh, Department of Defense as it existed at that time. Here, uh, just kind of for information, is what we're talking about, the Tacoma Narrows. And you see the existing bridge uh, across the, um, uh, the Tacoma Narrows. And it's there uh, doing a very serviceable job. Uh, also, something I haven't had a chance to run down. Uh, I mentioned some point-to-point -point driving times. Uh, on the left there, that looks very much like a leftover World War II era airfield. And so you can, this picture shows you that, or in a way shows you that if you had a 
Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, you could get to that airfield to defend it uh, expeditiously. Uh, but if you take that bridge away, uh, then you have to go back to that earlier picture of the uh, Puget Sound and kind of looking like a can like a plate of spaghetti. Okay, now let's um, have our history lesson for the for day, if you will. Um, again, this is important as far as the ethical issues are concerned. Um, up there in the Pacific uh, Northwest, um, of course, there's uh, lots and lots of uh, lumber and timber and this sort of thing. And that's the first um, economic activity that developed in the Pacific Northwest. And it continues to today. It's logging uh, and the lumber industry is very, very big in uh, Washington State and around the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, so there was a uh, logging industry started in, and uh, again, the, the Olympic Peninsula is, uh, is loaded with big trees. And so uh, a logging industry started, uh, and it started in the late 1800s. And um, one of the challenges was getting those logs out of, um, uh, the peninsula when they were chopped down and to the uh, lumber mills that were more around uh, Tacoma and Olympia and, and Seattle. And um, so originally in the 1800s, why the only way to get the lumber out of there, the logs out of there was uh, to put them on a wagon and uh, get some nice uh, beefy horses and, and drag them out. Uh, then moving forward through time, the railroad came into the picture. Uh, and so uh, uh, the railroad company that uh, developed up there in the Northwest was the Northern Pacific. And uh, the, uh, uh, the railroads, of course, uh, you know, greatly uh, enhanced, improved, expanded the ability to transport uh, all kinds of goods, uh, including lumber. And the, um, uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad Company uh, looked at this lumber industry on the Olympic Peninsula and uh, saw an important business opportunity uh, if there could be a bridge across the Tacoma Narrows. Um, otherwise, it would uh, just be a, an a impracticable uh, undertaking to try and, and build uh, railroad uh, lines, tracks uh, from out of the logging areas. And so the Northern Pacific Railroad in around the 1880s began to uh, look at the potential to, uh, to build a bridge across the uh, Tacoma Narrows that would allow them then to effectively service the Olympic Peninsula's uh, lumber industry. And um, the uh, Northern Pacific proposed a uh, trestle type bridge, a low level bridge uh, to carry the railroad tra traffic. Uh, a couple of reasons this is what the, the railroad uh, wanted to do. Uh, one is that a trestle type bridge is the cheapest kind of a bridge to build. The second is that it is a low level bridge <coughs> and railroad trains don't, railroad engines don't do well with uh, significant grades uh, going up hill and downhill, this sort of thing. They can only function effectively on very shallow, uh, generally speaking, grades. And um, with the trestle bridge, uh, you didn't have to, the, the trains would not have to climb a steep incline uh, a, as they would if there were a high level bridge of some sort there. 
So the Northern Pacific wanted to uh, build a trestle bridge and they didn't want to pay for it. Uh, the, um, uh, about this same time though, the federal government began to uh, become aware uh, as uh, the railroads developed, as highways, roads came into being, that um, there was a significant issue with these railroads and roads crossing waterways, rivers, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, the it was recognized at early on and at that time that um, uh, if you build a low level bridge across a body of navigable water, you shut off all um, uh, navigation capability on the waterways. Big driver of this, of course, was the development of the Mississippi River, but the same is true all over the country. So federal uh, legislation was enacted that said you can't uh, construct anything, particularly a bridge, that will uh, uh, interfere with uh, a navigable waterway, a river or whatever. And so this federal legislation um, ruled out the low-level bridge that the Northern Pacific uh, wanted to build. So um, that took care of the Northern Pacific and we moved through time and start getting into the 20th century and the, uh, the automobiles are coming into the picture and the commercial interests in the uh, Olympia and Tacoma areas uh, <clears throat> began to look at the issue of a uh, uh, of a bridge across the Tacoma Narrows from their local uh, perspective. And um, so they did had some engineers draw up some preliminary plans and uh, this sort of thing for a high level bridge that uh, would be consistent with the federal government's uh, requirements to not obstruct uh, navigable waterways. And so in the 20s and going into the uh, 30s, there were proposals for the uh, uh, design and construction of a s suspension bridge. Um, and um, the only uh, issue though was who's gonna pay for it. And the uh, commercial and government interests in the Pacific Northwest, Tacoma, uh, Olympia and Seattle uh, just didn't have the money to build a, a bridge like this. So uh, that's a rock in the road there. Here is a sketch of one of these uh, proposals for a suspension bridge. And uh, this is a uh, sketch of uh, a cantilever bridge that was proposed by the uh, uh, city of Tacoma. Uh, and all of these are high level bridges that would not impede the navigable waterway. And so uh, uh, no money, that was the issue. And so um, the um, <clears throat> um, one of the concepts that was developed for funding the bridge was a toll bridge. In other words, make it, uh, make the bridge a toll bridge. And this uh, was not uh, initially practicable uh, because the, um, the traffic that could be projected to use the bridge just wasn't that great. That the Pacific Northwest was, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, didn't have that much uh, population and traffic and this sort of thing. So um, the toll bridge went nowhere. Um, so uh, the folks up there, commercial and governmental interests said, well, we can't 
get the money to build a bridge. So let's uh, at least uh, start a ferry service so people can drive down to the water on one side, get on a ferry, take it across the other side. And at least there's would be some kind of uh, uh, way to get from one side to the other of the Tacoma Narrows. And so the state of Washington put out a contract uh, for a concession to operate uh, a ferry service. And the um, this concession agreement was awarded to a company called the Washington Navigation Company, and it was awarded in 1926, and it um, ran for 10 years uh, until 1936. And it, um, it included a no competition clause in it. In other words, uh, the state of Washington committed that um, it would not uh, let out any uh, other ferry contracts that would compete with the Washington Navigation Company. Um, this uh, no competition clause, however, uh, also applied to a bridge. Uh, so the um, situation was that once this concession, this ferry concession was, was awarded, uh, was that uh, no bridge could be uh, built across the Tacoma Narrows uh, until you, 10 years later uh, in 1936. So this no competition clause um, put the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the idea of a Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, on, the, uh, on the back burner for 10 years. So uh, we move through time and start getting into the 30s and into the mid 30s and the later uh, part of the 30s. And the funding issue changes. Um, the practicability of funding a bridge changes. And the um, um, <clears throat> one element in this was the uh, uh, expiring of the Washington Navigation Company's ferry concession in 1936. But when you get to 1936, uh, there was already the, uh, the specter of World War II uh, coming into uh, people's uh, thinking, uh, particularly in government. And um, so the uh, uh, the people in Washington D.C. the in the what was then the War Department uh, began to think about uh, what would happen if a large war started, and in particular, Japan was raising a lot of heck uh, in the Pacific. And the US began to perceive Japan as a potential adversary that would attack the US and attack uh, particularly its primary target undoubtedly would have been the Bremerton shipyard and uh, Puget Sound uh, because that's the closest part of the US to, uh, to Japan. So um, 1936, the uh, ferry concession expires. There's the specter of uh, uh, World War II coming onto the horizon, and the Department of Defense begins to take a significant interest in having a bridge that would improve transportation between Fort Lewis McCord and Bremerton. And um, so also uh, in the 30s, uh, what was happening on a national scale is the, um, um, the US was in the, middle, in the middle of the Great Depression. And uh, lots and lots and lots of, of course, of people were out of work. And the federal government uh, under Franklin Roosevelt wanted to try to do whatever it could 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, to uh, put people back to work, get the economy going again. And uh, the strategy, and one of the important strategies of the federal government in this area was public works projects, federally funded public works projects. And during the 30s, uh, these kinds of federal projects were being undertaken all over the country, all kinds of, of public infrastructure and buildings and things like that. So the, uh, uh, this bridge uh, that's being talked about would fall into this category of a nice big public works project that would put people to work uh, and uh, help with the, this econ uh, economic issue. So here we are in the uh, uh, moving into the late 30s. Uh, the Department of Defense is quite interested in getting a, uh, a bridge <clears throat> across the Tahoma Narrows, again, because of transportation issues between uh, uh, Fort Lewis, McCord, and Bremerton. And then also there's the public works uh, issue, uh, putting people to work. So now uh, the people in Washington state uh, began to look to the people in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a potential source of money, federal money. And so that's the situation in the, uh, uh, in the late uh, 30s. And uh, the military necessity. And uh, so the state of Washington <coughs> uh, engineers, the Washington Department of Highways, uh, which was under, uh, and the project was under the direction of a gentleman called, uh, named Clark Eldridge, uh, was given the job of coming up with a uh, design concept for a suspension bridge <clears throat> across the Tacoma Narrows. And uh, the intent was to take that design to the uh, appropriate people in Washington, D.C. and ask for federal money to build it. And um, so Eldridge prepared a, uh, a design for a suspension bridge using uh, conventional uh, bridge design practices uh, as they were known at that time. And those, those practices at that time still to a very large extent continue today. Uh, there hasn't been uh, massive changes in the fundamental concepts of bridge design. So uh, Eldridge's design, the Department of Highways of the state of Washington, was a conventional bridge. And the, the key element in the, in the bridge here was the roadway uh, uh, support structure. And um, you'll see uh, some sketches that'll explain this further. But the, um, uh, with Eldridge's design, the state of Washington's design, uh, deep open uh, uh, truss uh, girders were the, what supported the, the roadway uh, on the bridge. Uh, they spanned between the, uh, uh, the support structures and uh, uh, they carried the load of the roadway. So uh, Clark Eldridge, uh, State of Washington, uh, a conservative uh, uh, design, one that was backed by a substantial body of experiential knowledge. That's, there've been a number of bridges that were built this way. They work uh, so experiential knowledge was good in this area. And this design was submitted to the uh, people in Washington, DC, an agency called the Public Works Administration that controlled the purse strings, the money 
on these public works projects. And the state of Washington uh, requested $11 million for, the, uh, for this design. And here is Clark. Uh, and a side uh, point uh, that's not relevant to anything, but it's kind of interesting, is the director of the Washington State Highway Department uh, at that time was a gentleman named Lancy, or pardon me, Lacey Murrow, who was the brother of the very well-known uh, newsman and radio and television commentator, Edward R. Murrow. Uh, again, that's not relevant to anything, but an interesting little point. So Lacey Murrow was the director of the Washington State Highway Department at that time. Um, and this is a picture, a sketch uh, of the of Clark Eldridge's design for a suspension bridge uh, using a um, uh, state of the art uh, at that time uh, design, uh, open truss girders supporting the uh, uh, roadway, and these this open truss girder. Uh, they were 25 foot deep, uh, very deep trusses. And of course, with a, a truss or, or a girder, some, uh, with a girder, uh, uh, the, the deeper you make it, the stiffer uh, it is, the stronger it is. And I'm pretty sure we all remember that from some course. Um, so this was Clark Eldridge's design, uh, the key feature was the roadway support girders and they were uh, truss girders 25 feet deep. Important point with a uh, truss girder rather than a uh, solid girder like a wide flange, uh, the wind uh, can blow through the large openings in the girder. And this, as events proved, um, was quite important uh, because it's uh, windy up there in the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. And the Tacoma Narrows site uh, experienced routinely uh, high winds. Okay, now, though, uh, let's see. Um, tell you, we're almost on our uh, uh, time for us to take our first 10 minute break. Uh, so, but uh, just to cover another point before we, we break is that uh, in public works projects, whenever they come up, anytime a public agency has a large project that they want to undertake, there is kind of pushing and shoving <clears throat> between the uh, uh, engineers on the public agency side and the engineers in private companies. Uh, the private companies want the uh, public agency like the state of Washington to contract out the design work uh, uh, to a private engineering firm. The engineers on the public agency side, they say, no, we want to design this project in-house. And um, <clears throat> uh, once this uh, project uh, came onto the horizon. It was uh, known within the uh, appropriate uh, uh, engineering offices and so on and so forth throughout the country. This was a major project and the, that the state of Washington was proposing uh, to get the, the funding for from the federal government but now private engineering firms entered the picture and the competition for the design contract uh, uh, becomes a significant issue. Okay, now here we are at, uh, at 10 minutes before the uh, uh, hour. So let's take a 10 minute break and uh, 
during this 10 minute break, I am going to attempt to load up the um, uh, videos that I have so that you will be able to see a movie, an eight millimeter movie of the, uh, of the collapse. And uh, uh, if I'm successful, I'll show that in the second hour. So let's take a 10 minute break now, come back uh, on the hour. So I'll see you uh, uh, in 10 minutes.
Okay, this is Paul Geyer and I'm back. <clears throat> and I think I was able to load the, um, the videos that you'll uh, see later uh, of, the, uh, of the actual collapse of the bridge. Um, <clears throat> so here is a major uh, <clears throat> public works contract, that design contract that is up for grabs. Uh, the state of Washington engineers that's typical. Um, and, uh, but the consulting engineering firms uh, were throughout the US uh, were looking at this project and saying, well, gee, we'd like to have a contract that size. Now, uh, a point to bear in mind as we start looking at these numbers here, $8 million and $11 million, this sort of thing. Uh, remember, these are uh, 1930s, uh, early 1940s era prices. So obviously they would be much, much more uh, today. So a, um, uh, uh, a group of consulting engineers uh, led by a very well-known, very prominent uh, bridge engineer from New York, uh, Mr. Lee Moisier, um, wanted to get this contract to compete for it. And uh, Mr. Moiseev and his associates went to the people that controlled the money, the Public Works Administration and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and said, hey, the state of Washington engineers have submitted this proposal to you and um, they dollars to, uh, to build this bridge and uh, heck, we can, uh, we can design it uh, cheaper and uh, build it for only $8 million. And that was, that was not chump change back in the 1930s. So uh, the private engineering interests go to the people with the money, the federal government, and say, hey, we can uh, use this uh, bridge uh, so it can be built for much less than what the state of Washington engineers say theirs will uh, cost. And um, <clears throat> where the private engineering firms were, oh, um, I, let me mention this. I've got a problem with my controls here uh, on my screen, and for some reason I can't see my chat. I did notice during halftime that there was a question of was this a design build uh, contract. The answer is no. Uh, back at that point in time, the law of the land was. Uh, that public works contracts were always awarded uh, using the traditional design bid build uh, uh, approach. So it was competitive working drawings and specifications, and then those are put out for cons competitive construction bids. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the design contract is separate from the construction contract. Uh, and uh, the way that uh, uh, Mr. Moiseev uh, undertook his reference to a apparently a uh, technical paper or some information uh, that had been developed by what apparently was uh, an academic uh, uh, gentleman in Austria. And uh, it, the theory that was developed by this Austrian academician uh, was that uh, as far as the horizontal winds acting on a bridge like this, that the roadway sport girders uh, did not have to uh, resist uh, that lateral force uh, to the degree that uh, the uh, state of Washington engineers and the conventional designs of that era 
uh, dictated. They, uh, this Austrian engineer's theory was that uh, this horizontal force, a significant amount of it would be resisted by the suspension cables. Um, and as a result, the, in um, Moiseev's design, the roadway support girders didn't have to be 25 feet deep. Uh, they only had to be, um, what was it, eight feet deep. Uh, and also, they didn't have to be uh, truss girders uh, eight feet deep. Uh, you could use a, an I-beam uh, configuration, solid uh, uh, web in the, uh, uh, the I-beam. And this is where Moiseev's design was going to save all of this money, this uh, $3 million, was by uh, using by a, a design with uh, 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 with sport girders that were not as deep as in the uh, Clark Eldridge State of Washington design. And this is was essentially where Moiseev was going to save all this money. And the federal authorities that controlled the money, uh, I'm just talking off the top of my head and perhaps editorializing, but they probably were not engineers. They were probably what uh, sometimes is referred to as bean counters in a bureaucracy, um, just budget analysts or something like that. And so they look at this proposal and they say, well, gee, um, this Moiseev group uh, uh, can save uh, the federal government uh, $3 million. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, so the federal bean counters said to the state of Washington, okay, we'll give you the money to build your bridge, but we're only gonna give you uh, $8 million and you must uh, farm out the engineering design work to uh, Mr. Moiseev, a private company. And uh, this, of course, you know, naturally didn't set well with the, uh, 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 the Washington State engineers with Clark Eldridge and uh, Clark Eldridge uh, and the Washington Department of Highways were quite clear that uh, Moiseev's design was uh, unsafe and uh, not uh, consistent with the state of knowledge, experiential knowledge of uh, designing bridges. So uh, federal government says to state of Washington, okay, you can have the money for the bridge, but you have to farm out the uh, design work to this New York uh, engineering firm. And uh, so that's the way the project came together. And um, again, the Washington State engineers uh, were, were not happy about this. Uh, Moiseev's plan was called fundamentally uh, unsound and that the design made the Narrows Bridge lighter and narrower than any bridge ever built uh, just to save money. Um, and um, here is Mr. Moiseev. And I want to emphasize again, uh, a very well-known, very experienced bridge engineer and designer for many years, uh, uh, an impeccable reputation, but uh, his reputation essentially was destroyed uh, as a result of what subsequently happened with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And so this is a picture of uh, Moiseev's design. Um, suspension bridge uh, and with a very shallow, eight foot deep, solid I-beam roadway support girders. Uh, and the, the, the point about the, the being uh, an I-beam girder uh, means that the horizontal winds, and there are a lot of winds uh, at the Tacoma Narrow site, uh, 
uh, that the horizontal uh, forces, uh, the wind, could not pass through the uh, gir girders easily as they as it could with a a girder design, open girder design. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> bridge's main span was 2,800 feet. Let's see, there's a table here shortly. Um, I think I like this table here to uh, kind of uh, compare things. Uh, comparable bridges of the same era. Um, the George Washington Bridge, which is back there in the New York area, um, the uh, <clears throat> length of the center span was 3,500 feet. Uh, the girder depth was 36 feet. Uh, the ratio of the girder depth to the length of the center span, and this kind of gives you a feel for the, the stiffness, uh, was 1 to 120 and the ratio of the width of the roadway to the length of the center span was uh, 1 to 33. And the uh, <clears throat> width uh, a, with a, the width of the roadway is important in uh, uh, the overall stiffness of the structure, just like a, you take an I-beam and if you make it with uh, wi wider uh, webs uh, or flanges and, and a deep web, um, you have a stiffer beam, it's stiffer. So George Washington Bridge completed in 1935 um, at a cost of 60 million. And um, the, uh, uh, the roadway sport girders were very deep uh, truss type. Uh, and it was a, uh, it was a, I think a four lane uh, roadway, might have been six lanes, not sure. Um, then there was the Golden Gate Bridge in Northern California, another suspension bridge. Uh, long span, 4,200 feet. Uh, again, the roadway support girders, deep truss girders, 25 feet deep. Very analogous to the George Washington Bridge. And uh, <clears throat> the ratio of the girder depth to the length of the center span, uh, 168, and the ratio of the width of the roadway to the length of the center span, one to 47. Uh, so uh, George Washington and Golden Gate, both with roadway sport girders uh, that were uh, open truss girders deep. Uh, and this was the scheme uh, proposed by the Washington State Engineers by Clark Eldridge. Then you have um, on the right hand side here, you have the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and the Bronx Whitestone Bridge, which is also back in the New York area. And you see the uh, numbers there. Now the Bronx Whitestone, um, in my reviewing of things, is, was kind of, is kind of the evil twin of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know if, uh, Moisiev designed the Bronx Whitestone. But in any event, uh, the Bronx Whitestone is analogous to the Tacoma Narrows. Uh, it used uh, shallow uh, I-beam type girders for the roadway support, uh, only 11 feet deep at Bronx Whitestone. Uh, and at Tacoma Narrows, Moisiev's eight foot deep. Uh, the roadway, the width at the Bronx Whitestone, the 74 feet versus uh, Tacoma Narrows, only 39 feet, just a two lane road at Tacoma Narrows because the traffic didn't warrant it. And um, then the, uh, the ratios uh, that you see and the, um, 
uh, the Bronx Whitestone was uh, completed at just about the same time as the Tacoma Narrows was completed. And the Bronx Whitestone began to, right, essentially right after it was completed, to uh, display the same kind of uh, behavior, oscillations, uh, as were experienced at Tacoma Narrows. And uh, then the, the Tacoma Narrows uh, collapsed uh, within a year of its completion. And this was a real wake up call for the uh, people, whoever it is that owns the Bronx Whitestone Bridge. Um, it was a real wake up call for them. They knew that, they, uh, that there was a big risk that their bridge was going to collapse. And so they immediately uh, undertook uh, remedial uh, repairs or actions or modifications. And we'll see what those were. And those remedial measures that were taken at the Bronx Whitestone Bridge prevented it from collapsing. And it continues to uh, in service today and, and is doing a good job. But uh, you can uh, probably the the real uh, really important number to look at to get a feel for how out in the ozone the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was is that ratio of girder depth to length of center span. The George Washington and the Golden Gate traditional well proven. Uh, designs uh, 1 to 120 and 1 to 168. Uh, the Tacoma Narrows was 1 to 350, way outside the experiential envelope. So, um, and this to the, to the ethical issue of uh, if you are undertaking to do something that is way outside the uh, experiential envelope, uh, you need to do it very carefully, take baby steps, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean you can't go outside the experiential envelope, but you need to proceed very cautiously. And in essence, what this has come to mean in, in bridge design and uh, design of a lot of other things is modeling. Uh, and uh, as we will see, uh, as an afterthought, uh, the uh, uh, gentleman from the University of Washington who was hired to do a post-mortem evaluation of the collapse uh, was just beginning to construct wind tunnel tests for the bridge. And this was uh, the, I'm pretty sure I'm correct about this, the first time <coughs> that wind tunnel testing was planned uh, to be applied to the construction and to the design of bridges. Uh, wind tunnel testing, of course, developed around the airplane business, but um, it um, had not been applied uh, to the um, design of bridges to uh, see how the bridge performed in high winds. Uh, whereas, uh, as far as lessons learned by the bridge community, uh, today, uh, wind tunnel testing, or in this computer age, uh, uh, computerized test modeling, pardon me, uh, of uh, uh, shapes and sizes and this sort of thing, is standard operating procedure on large bridges these days. So this was a lesson that uh, has been learned by the bridge design community. So um, Moiseev gets the contract, um, shallow, uh, solid I-beam girders to support the roadway. Construction began in September of 1938, and the bridge was completed and open to traffic in July of 1940. Here are some pictures <clears throat> under construction. Uh, 
Uh, and he, this picture shows a very uh, elegant, uh, beautiful bridge. The bridge was completed and opened. Another um, picture of the bridge, and you see the solid uh, I beam uh, configuration of the roadway support girders. And here you see the guys that were doing all the heavy lifting. And here's opening day. You see the, uh, the narrow roadway. Uh, just two lanes. And the program for the opening. Okay, now I'm going to uh, endeavor to show you a video uh, if my controls work properly. Okay, now this, this is a video I'm going to show you and I Assume that you can all see this. If there's any problem with that, speak up on the audio stream because I can't see my uh, chat box. Now this, as I say, uh, everybody knew this bridge was in serious trouble. Uh, and on this particular day, the winds were high, but they were not uh, uh, outrageously high. They were about 40 miles an hour and um, blowing uh, through the Tacoma Narrows. And so people were out there with their uh, uh, eight millimeter cameras and uh, filming the bridge. It was closed to traffic, so there were, were no uh, uh, fatalities uh, other than there was a puppy dog that got caught on the uh, that got caught on the bridge and uh, uh, didn't make it off. But here you see the oscillations. Now, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, rotary oscillations, left, right, left, right. Up until this point in time, the oscillations that had been observed has, have been transverse, up and down, up and down, up and down, sinusoidal wave type thing. Uh, and for uh, some reason, probably because one or more of the suspension cables broke and uh, uh, there was an asymmetry in the support for the uh, roadway and um, that allowed this kind of uh, torsional oscillation to take place. So, but you see, this is a big time oscillation. There is one car that got trapped on the, uh, on the bridge and that was the one that the puppy dog was in. So oscillations continue. This video is about four minutes long. This is uh, the suspension cables <clears throat> being knocked about. You see how violent the uh, oscillations are. Uh, Professor Farkerson is the University of Washington engineer that had been uh, hired by the uh, Washington Department of Highways to uh, try to analyze and propose uh, remedial action uh, to uh, control this oscillation that was, as I say, this oscillation was observed on the bridge practically it was while it was still under construction. And um, the, um, Paul, the, Paul, Paul, uh, we can, yeah, question. We, we can't uh, see the video. It's not going. You can't see the video. Yes. Okay. Um, hmm. 
Try again, please. Okay. Uh, let's see now. I need to. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, give me a minute to play around with the um, controls here. Um, with me. Um, stick with me. These controls are kind of clunky. Um, well, if you type the link in the chat box, people can uh, click. Makes it easier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll take that uh, into account. And uh, I'm not getting anywhere with this. Um, okay, I, th I think the bottom line is um, uh, I'm not able to show you the, um, the video, uh, but uh, you're get you get the, uh, the same uh, there are some still pictures here that you'll see very shortly. Um, and let's, let's get to those. And they uh, will give you still pictures uh, that, that show what the video shows. Now, um, talking about Farkerson and being hired to uh, 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 evaluate the bridge and try to come up with some remedial measures. Uh, this photo here just kind of shows you the state of the technology uh, back then in the late 30s, early 40s. Just a transit and a movie camera. That's what Farkerson had to work with. And these are his field notes. Um, let's see, let me get to my... Uh, these are his field notes. And um, um, so the, there, were, there were some mitigation measures that were tr tried to be, that were put in place uh, as kind of a Band-Aid uh, immediately after the bridge was opened, some tie down cables and hydraulic buffers and this sort of thing. But the short story is none of them worked. Um, one of the proposals was to drill holes, uh, proposed mitigation measures, was to drill holes in the side of the solid girders so that the wind could uh, pass through them. And uh, of course that would, uh, uh, help get the wind, uh, reduce the lateral wind load on the girders, but it would also greatly weaken the girders. So that was a, a non-starter. Um, now here, uh, getting back to the evil twin, if you will, the Bronx Whitestone, these, this shows the remedial measures that over the years have been uh, put in place uh, at the Bronx Whitestone. One was to add stiffening trusses to the roadway support structure, as you see there. And they were added in 1946. 
and then in uh, 2004, uh, airfoil uh, fairings were uh, added uh, to smooth the airflow around the solid uh, uh, part of the uh, of the girders. Now you notice uh, those dates there. Uh, stiffening trusses were added in 1946, but the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapsed in 1940, so it. Uh, and the New York people were aware of the problem they had. The, the, the delay, if you will, the reason for the delay in getting stiffening trusses uh, added to that bridge and subsequently the uh, streamlined fairings was because uh, during World War II, there were um, uh, great uh, limitations on the availability of steel for civilian purposes. So uh, you just couldn't get steel then. So they were not able to um, get the stiffening trusses installed at Bronx Whitestone until uh, after the war. Um, so the uh, on November 7th, the wind was blowing through the Narrows at a steady speed of 42 miles an hour. This steady speed is important because one of the th theories that was propounded initially was that uh, 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 of resonance frequency, that the wind uh, force on acting on the bridge uh, was uh, uh, at such a frequency that it was right at the resonant frequency of the bridge. Oscillations uh, <clears throat> are set in at the resonant frequency and it collapses. But that theory didn't, uh, idea didn't go anywhere simply because, or a major reason was that the wind was not oscillating. It was a steady, roughly 40 mile an hour wind. And uh, so you can't have resonance if you don't have an oscillating forcing frequency. So uh, <clears throat> at around 10 a.m. on November 7th, less than a year after it was opened, the bridge was opened, uh, the bridge began to oscillate severely in the torsional mode for the probable reasons that I mentioned. Uh, the bridge was closed to traffic <clears throat> and at 11.10, a little more than an hour later, the center span collapsed. So here are some photos, uh, and these will have to uh, uh, take the place of the video, which for technical reasons I uh, am not able to show to you now. Um, so the, um, uh, the oscillations, torsional, Uh, at its uh, maximum, uh, the elevation of the sidewalk on one side uh, was 28 feet higher than the sidewalk on the other side. So uh, that's a lot of a uh, lot of twisting. And uh, after the um, uh, about an hour. Uh, this is the collapse uh, of the bridge. The remnants from the collapse. Another angle. You see the two individuals walking on the um, suspension cable. Failed suspension cable. And there's some distortion of the uh, uh, support towers as a result of all of the thrashing around. Um, you, you, can, uh, you can see these videos 
that I'm talking about by going to YouTube. Um, and you can just search for Tacoma Narrows videos and you'll find several. They're posted online and uh, they're, uh, uh, so you can see the, the eight millimeter movies that were made and that I wasn't able to show you. And these are links to some of those. Oh, now wait a second here. Let's try this. Uh, okay. Um, I didn't know that I had embedded this video in these um, PowerPoints, but now I assume that uh, you can all see this video. If you can't, for some reason, speak up on the, uh, on the audio stream and let me know. about a three-minute video. Get rid of that background music there. That uh, person uh, walking down the center line, that is, as I think maybe I already mentioned this, that is uh, Professor Farkerson. And uh, that's the car that the puppy dog was in. And here is the ultimate collapse. Okay, um, let's uh, move on. You've seen uh, what the, the incident looked like. Uh, so the um, formal technical uh, evaluation of the failure of the incident was undertaken and uh, it was um, basically concluded that uh, uh, 
the von Karman effect uh, was the cause of the the failure. Uh, I mean, the, the cause of the failure was the inadequacy of the design, but the forces that caused it to fail were probably because of the von Karman effect, which means, which is that uh, when a, uh, a blunt body, uh, like an airplane wing or a, um, or a bridge girder encounters a high velocity winds that uh, the wind uh, spins on the downstream side kind of into uh, vortexes. And these vortexes are oscillating and that uh, probably this von Karman effect was, was the forces that led to the failure, the wind blowing against the, uh, the blunt body, the, uh, the roadway support girders. Um, and um, von Kar Theodore von Karman from Caltech was on the uh, technical review panel. Um, but uh, uh, the, and the resonance hypothesis, there's a discussion of it here. Uh, but like I say, its resonance, uh, I think, has been pretty well discarded as a consideration. So the forces that caused the failure were uh, the wind acting on the blunt body, the girders, and uh, the, uh, vortices that spin off the back side of the blunt, blunt body in an oscillating manner, and that those were the forces that caused the failure. Um, and let's skip to um, aeroelastic flutter uh, is similar in a way to the von Karman effect, aeroelastic flutter is is just if you uh, if you put something in an airstream, uh, the um, uh, the thing may just flutter. To get a picture in your mind, just visualize taking a piece of paper about uh, one inch wide and uh, eleven inches long, holding it up at eye level and uh, releasing it and as it flutters falls to the ground uh, it flutters and that that was probably a uh, um, a force that was acting on the on the bridge and you can kind of see in this sketch the idea that uh, the roadway uh, cross section there the wind at one point in time is pushing it to rotate counterclockwise and then it uh, uh, springs back to uh, clockwise and so on and so forth. Um, but the, um, uh, the bottom line is that the, uh, the reason that the um, bridge failed was because of the, the design was uh, inadequate. It was too far outside of the um, experiential envelope. The <clears throat> Moiseev had taken a design or a, a theory. And remember, a theory is nothing but a theory until it's uh, been validated by experience. And this shallow, solid roadway support girder that uh, was theorized by this Austrian engineer or academician, uh, <clears throat> just was not proven in experience. And this bridge was uh, substantially outside the experiential envelope. So uh, the, to my way of looking at things, there are two ethical issues. The first one is, if you are undertaking to do something um, outside the experiential envelope, 
nobody's ever designed an airplane this way. Nobody's ever designed a bridge this way. Nobody's ever designed an earth fill dam this way. Uh, if you're stepping outside that experiential envelope, you need to move very, very cautiously. And you need to do things like, uh, you, you can step outside the experiential envelope, but you need to do it very slowly and in a measured way, like by model testing. Uh, and of course, in this day and age, computer modeling. Uh, also, uh, redundancy uh, is, and safety factors are uh, a, a, an approach that you can take. Uh, I'm go going to undertake to design a, a suspension bridge with uh, a, a span longer than has previously been done. Uh, and I'm going, since I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to throw in some redundancy uh, and um, increase my safety factors when I'm doing the calculations. So uh, short answer as far as ethical issue number one is if you're uh, undertaking to step outside the experiential envelope, you need to uh, do it in a very measured manner. Now, the, the second uh, ethical ish issue um, uh, that is important, uh, I believe, is the, uh, uh, you can review these slides at your leisure. Um, and, um, this is a bridge near where I live in Northern California that uh, there was substantial uh, uh, wind tunnel testing done on it. Now, the, the second ethical issue is um, that uh, in competing for engineering contracts, do not propose designs that are not supported by adequate and complete theoretical and or experiential knowledge. In other words, don't go as Mr. Moiseev did to the people that had the money, controlled the money for the project and say, I can design it cheaper uh, and save you a bunch of money, so give me the contract. Uh, we see this all the time, particularly in this age of design build contracting where uh, uh, contractors go to uh, entities that have contracts and they say, oh, well, we can, uh, we can design it faster, cheaper, better value uh, <clears throat> because of uh, how good we are. And it, you can't do that. The reason with engineering projects is you don't control everything. The engineer, uh, although they, we sometimes like to think of ourselves as being in charge of projects, in reality, we're not. Uh, there are all kinds of people and entities that are involved in the design and construction of a project. They have different levels of technical competence, ranging from zero to a lot. Uh, they have their own economic motivations uh, and uh, those economic motivations uh, led to, in this case, a, a very bad result. Uh, Moiseev and his associates wanted to uh, get this contract, so they went to the uh, people with the money in Washington, D.C. and said, we can design it uh, uh, cheaper with this uh, new design we've got. And um, the result was the disaster that, uh, that you saw. It, uh, as I say, it was, uh, and the, the um, Washington State engineers uh, did not uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, let this go unnoted. Uh, Clark Eldridge, among other things that he and others said, uh, was that the quote, the men who held the purse strings were the whip crackers on the entire project. 
Uh, in other words, the bean counters were making the decisions. We had a tried and true conventional bridge design. We were told we couldn't have the necessary money without using plans furnished by an Eastern firm of engineers chosen by the money lenders. So competition for engineering projects, it's always going to be there and there's practically always going to be the uh, uh, competition between public agency engineering staffs and uh, private engineering firms. Uh, so the, um, uh, just to tie a ribbon around this package, who ended up paying the bills? Uh, the state of Washington did have uh, insurance on the bridge. And so it was insurance companies that had to come up with quite a bit of the money. But um, an interesting or just a, a side point is one of the insurance policies covering the bridge, uh, the state of Washington paid the premium to an insurance agent uh, who then embezzled the money and never passed it on to the uh, insurance company. So that insurance company uh, escaped liability. Um, and the, uh, the replacement bridge, this is, was built in 1950. Uh, <clears throat> and you see the tried and true open truss girders supporting this new bridge. And this bridge is um, uh, uh, in service and uh, doing a good job. And you see it's a very attractive bridge. Um, okay, that uh, brings us to the end of uh, our discussion today. So uh, I hope this was um, uh, kind of interesting for you, gives you something to think about, and um, will allow you to um, uh, handle projects more meaningfully in the future. With that, uh, let me just uh, thank you very much for letting me chat with you today. And now I'm going to uh, just kind of close things out. So thanks a lot. Bye.